that in. Alright. a few more people to pop in before we start and then By the way, um, the dynamic questions are up on the quizzes page of Blackboard if only one wants to give them a try. Um, I've been slacking off a bit on these um, tests, so I finally got dynamic up. Um, I'll see when I can get the timing quiz up. Hopefully the timing quiz can be a bit shorter. or Maybe it'll be a bit longer considering that it's easy to set questions on it, I'm not sure. We'll see. But either way, the um, dynamic questions are available for you. Quizzes. Yeah, that one's available as well. Alright, 10.59. Give it another minute and then we will get started. That looks like 11 o'clock to me, so let's get started then. Right, so um, this lecture is the system level timing lecture, so this is going to be building um, mainly on the... Just wait, someone's coming in. So this lecture is going to be building mainly on the sequential lectures, lectures 15 and 16. Um, so knowing if you've um, done the sequential quiz and you remember your sequential that's going to make this um, a fair bit easier um, but yeah so this is system level timing issues so we're going to look at um, the timing constraints in a bit more detail right so uh, in these sequential lectures we saw that there's two types of storage Static storage, which we looked at in a bit of detail with the bistable element, which we either cut the feedback, where we either cut the feedback path as we did with the D flip flop. Or we overpower the feedback path, so this is for SRAMs, which we didn't really look at. Um, and then we um, also heard that there was dynamic storage, so this is storage which stores the um, state on parasitic capacitors, a bit like our dynamic logic, but with a very, very trivial um, function where it just stores the data and then allows you to read it at some point. Dynamic logic is generally simpler, so it's got fewer transistors in it. Um, it runs at a higher speed and lower power, but because it's dynamic, um, it's got low noise immunity and you need to refresh it quite often. 
um, so on the region of milliseconds. So, yeah, we saw those, these two types of storage. Um, the majority of the stuff we'll look at is D flip-flop based um, static storage, right? Um, and then these sequential elements can be combined with our combinational logic, <coughs> excuse me, um, into a generic digital system. So no matter how complex your digital system is, it can generally be split into five components. An input-output component, so this is where you communicate with a real-world machine, so that we have some form of um, knowledge of what happened in the past. We have a data path, which um, modifies the state and the output and the input to be stored in the memory and some new set of outputs. So the data path decides how to modify, um, produces the modifications for the outputs and the state based on their current values. And then we have a control section, um, the data path applies. and possibly um, chooses one part of your memory at a time to um, put through your data path, and then it'll be up to the control logic to decide, okay, I want this piece of memory to be sent to the data path for processing and to come back, and possibly even to choose which input to send in and which outputs to send out. Right? So it chooses which bits of data get sent to the data path. And then the final fifth component is the interconnect. Generally, the logic in the data path, the memory and the input and output are fixed, right? And it will be the control which decides which bits of memory um, in, and input and output to connect up to the data path, right? So generally the control determines what the connections should be between these components, right? Because at the end of the day, you can't uncreate a NAND gate or a NOR gate or an XOR gate on your circuit. You can only give it different inputs and you can give it different inputs by controlling what's connected to it, right? So this is generally how a digital system works, right? These five components, the input, output, memory, data path, and control. Right, um, looking at some of the basic building blocks for these um, components, your data path is going to be where all your data processing goes on. It's where you're going to be taking one piece of data and converting it from a well-known function to another piece of data. So we've got execution units, um, like your adders, your multipliers, your dividers, your shifters, all di doing different arithmetic operations or logical operations on your data. You'll have um, something called a register file. Uh, sometimes this is included as part of a memory, sometimes it's included as part of a data path, um, but it's a small bit of memory, um, which is very fast to access. And then your pipeline registers, which sit in between different stages of your um, data path. And then we've got multiplexes and decoders to decide what is connected up. So you'll have your execution unit. You might have some interface with the register file. You'll have multiplexers to decide what goes into the execution unit. And you'll have demultiplexers to decide where the output of the execution unit goes, okay? Um, alternatively, sometimes these registers might be one of the multiplexer inputs and take output from one of the branches of the demultiplexer. That is an option, depending on the exact system design, right? Um, you have your control 
um, section, which is generally some form of finite state machine. Um, even a very, very complex, for example, x86 processor will fundamentally be a set of finite state machines, um, all of which are controlling different parts of the um, data path. Um, you'll have your interconnect, which is going to be a mixture of switches, arbiters, and buses, and these switches, arbiters, and buses are generally made out of objects like multiplexers or things like transmission gates. Of it, just to abbreviate it, transmission gates um, and other forms of pass logic, right? Um, and then your memory is obviously built on out of your SRAM, um, which is uh, your DRAM, which is your dynamic storage, and then other specialist objects called like TLBs and buffers. TLBs basically just uh, determine the mapping between virtual memory and physical memory. Right, and they allow you to very quickly look up the correct physical address for a given virtual address. Um, so we've got these systems which have input, output, memory, data path, and control, and interconnect. Right, um, and we know that we've got some sequential logic in it, which has some setup and hold times. Right. So we need to find a way to work out how to determine whether we've um, a bit, um, whether we're abiding by those setup and hold times. Oh, question. Uh, okay, quick question from Jaideep. Is there any way we can do the Lab 4 and Mini project if you want to? Yes, you can. Um, I don't know whether I've remembered to upload those two to Blackboard. Um, if I haven't, I will do so. Um, but yes, you can do them if you want to. Um, you've got all the tools you need to do them. Um, especially with the lab scripts present, so uh, I'll make sure those are uploaded and you can have a go at them if you want. Um, I do advise you have a go if possible. Right, um, so back to timing classifications. Um, there's three, well, there's two main classifications and then you can just sort of mix them up. Uh, synchronous systems, like the very basic synchronous system, you've got multiple sequential elements, so I'll draw these as D flip flops. Right? And then you have a single global clock signal being provided to every single register in your device. Okay? Every single register has exactly the same clock signal. They all, at the same moment in time, take their input and copy it to their output and then there will be some amount of combinational logic leading up to the next sequential element and then on the same moment they will all copy from input to output. Um, the functionality is um, ensured so we make sure that we can um, keep our setup and hold constraints um, based on very strict constraints on the clock signal generation and distribution so that we can get rid um, in order to minimize the amount of skew and jitter in this clock distribution. So if we imagine our clock is generated here, the time for it to get to this register is going to be a lot shorter. In fact, let's just change the color of that. time for it to get to this register is going to be much shorter than the time it takes to get to this register. And so we can use various techniques to make sure that the delay getting to here and to here is minimized by the way we route our clock. And then also we've got clock jitter, which is about a non-perfect clock where maybe this time here T0 is not the same as this time here, T1. If T0 and T1 aren't the same, then we need to um, design our logic for the smallest of the two because of our setup constraints. So we want to minimize the jitter between um, the jitter, which is the difference between T0 and T1, right? So that's clock jitter. We want to minimize how much the clock varies cycle by cycle. 
and then the clock skew is how much it varies from position to position on the chip, right? We need to minimize these so that we've got nice um, setup and hold constraints that we can act, um, that we can satisfy easily. Conversely, to synchronous systems, there's the possibility of an asynchronous system, where rather than having a single clock signal distributed be be um, around the entire circuit, you've got two items, and then your logic also contains a component which tells the next unit when to trigger, right? So, not it's logic and delay, or alternatively, handshaking. Right? What happens is the bit of logic between our two sequential elements decides when the next sequential element is allowed to um, take hold of its data, right? By doing this, we don't have these weird constraints on how we distribute our global clock signal, and it's much easier to satisfy the setup and hold constraints individually. But this extra handshaking or delay logic costs us in terms of area and power, right? And then we have hybrid signal um, systems which are not quite synchronous, but definitely not asynchronous, where maybe we've got uh, four different clocks over our chip, and then between these clocks we have to synchronize and we have to have handshaking, but within one of those clock, um, the domain of one of those clocks, we can use all our synchronous design principles, where we just assume that we can just um, satisfy our satisfy our setup and hold times, right? So it's um, um it depends on what type of um circuit you're producing for smaller systems, maybe like very very small microcontrollers. They might be an entirely synchronous system or very, very, very small custom logic systems will be um, entirely synchronous. They'll have one clock signal. Conversely, for very, very large systems, they will most likely be hybrid um, because they'll have maybe one clock for the um, core ALU and uh, the logic and um, like the... Uh, so what you would imagine as your data processing side would have one clock and then you would have a different clock for your memory and then maybe another clock for each of your different types of outputs so, and then you would have to synchronize between each of these different um, clocks um, and so big processors like your Intel x86 processors are hybrid systems but this is generally starting to encroach on the smaller systems so even uh, modest microprocessors nowadays are hybrid systems where they've got lots of different clocks in them, um, but not quite as many as a big x86 processor. So let's look at the synchronous timing because asynchronous is not something we particularly um, cover here. So looking at the synchronous timing, um, we saw last lecture that we have our setup time and our hold time. Um, and then we saw the two constraints. We say that's the period of the clock. So that's the time from here to here. Must be greater than or equal to the time it takes f from th for the data to get from the clock to the output. Then the time to get through the combinational logic and be have a valid data at the output. Plus the setup time. Right, so setup p logic and then the CQ delay. Right, the time for valid data to get from one clock edge to the next clock edge must be shorter than the time between those clock edges. Okay, conversely, we need to make sure that this data doesn't get through too fast so that the Contamination delay of a re register plus the contamination delay of the combinational um, logic 
must not be shorter than the hold time, okay? Because otherwise we will corrupt a piece of data that we've just output on the same clock edge, right? And we can see this on here. So from this clock edge, we'll have some CQ. Then we'll have some uh, propagation delay of the logic. And then we have some setup time. And we need to make sure that the data changes before the setup time starts. Similarly, we output some data for, um, on our clock edge. Um, or we output some data on our clock edge and we make, need to make sure that the contamination delay is not shorter than the hold time. So in this circuit, we can see we've actually got a hold time violation here because we output um, take some data um, in to R1 on this clock edge. And then before the hold time has expired on R2, that data has managed to get to this point here. Right? This isn't good for us. It means that um, it means that we've violated our hold time and we've corrupted the data that's sitting at this output here on uh, clock edge two. Right? Obviously, in the ideal situation, um, the time at which we arrive at this register is going to be the same as the time at which we arrive at this register with our clock signal. But obviously, due to process variations, due to differences in the um, routing from one register to the other, um, unfortunately, that's not going to be the case. There is going to be some delay in this wire, so our signal will reach here first, and only sometime later will it reach here. So we'll see TCLK1, and we'll see TCLK2, and there will be some skew between them. Or it might be the other way around. TC, uh, have I lost my... Huh. Give me a sec, uh, one of the blackboard things didn't work. Right, um, share application screen. Right, uh, right, okay, um, that should be that back. Um, yeah, it seems that, um, we dropped, um, the uh, third year course for a moment there. Sorry about that. So as I was saying, um, T clock two could be sometime after, or conversely, it could be sometime before. So we've got our positive skew and our negative skew, right? Depending on which direction T clock two is relative to T clock one, right? And then obviously this time might change cycle to cycle based on the jitter in the system, right? So how do we minimize the skew between different registers, right? A um, really common um, example is what we call an H tree, right? Uh, how can clock two be faster than clock one? Um, so if I go back to, um, normally, the cause behind that is that you've got your uh, R1, you've got your R2, and your clock is actually coming from the right-hand side rather than the left. Right? Uh, what was that question over there? Since T-clock 2 is ahead, of, how is it possible for T-clock 2 to be ahead? Yeah. So if your clock is instead coming from the right rather than coming from the left, what you end up with is you end up with T-clock 2 transitions. Yeah. I can't write today. 
TCLK2 and then sometime later T clock 1 transitions because T clock 1 is after some delay because there is um, a longer wire going to register 1 than register 2 okay so depending on which direction your clock is coming from the direction of your skew will change right or it could be some other thing like a difference in buffers so another example is if you have oh, where's some space there we go if you have two registers like this um, very different parts of the chip um, and then you've got um, a buffer leading to that one and a buffer leading to this one right based on the same clock signal if this buffer has a TPD of uh, let's say 80 picoseconds and this one has TPD equals 100 picoseconds then you'll have a clock skew of 20 picoseconds because this one will be delayed rel um, R1 will be delayed relative to R2 by the 20 picoseconds difference in these two buffers right so that's the other option it could be a physical routing constraint where the clock comes from one side and then goes across to the other or it could be a difference in the speed of the individual buffers which provide clocks to each um, register so that's why it may be the case that T clock 2 is before T clock 1 rather than after. All right? So in order to try and reduce this skew, we have something called an H tree, right? The the idea behind an H tree is that any path through this H tree should have exactly the same delay. Is there a provision to add some buffer to delay T clock 1 by the same amount to match T clock 2? Um, not really, because the diff... Uh, well, yes and no. Um, if, you've got, if you know that you've got a situation where you've got a short path to register 1 and a long path to register 2, you could theoretically add a buffer so that um, register 1 is delayed somewhat, so that they're at the same time. Um, however, one, this is going to increase the power um, consumption of your circuit without actually, and also increase the area without adding any functionality to your circuit. But also, because this inverter will vary on a case-by-case -case basis, you're never going to be able to get it um, exact. So on chip 1, maybe you manage to perfectly match up R1 and R2. But on chip 2, which is exactly the same as chip 1, it's just a physically separate chip, um, maybe the d inverter is a bit, um, the buffer takes a bit longer, and so actually R1 comes after R2, and then on another chip, the inverter is a bit faster, so R1 become, um, comes before R2. So that's the thing, like... These two inverters are designed to be exactly the same. Well, when I say inverters, I mean buffers. Um, inverters are buffers, buffers are inverters. Um, but So these two buffers could be designed to be the same, but due to process variations, which is what you saw with your Monte Carlo simulations in Lab 3, these inverters will vary on a case-by-case -case basis. And when that happens, you'll end up with a clock skew. Uh, will the positive clock skew sometimes be useful for setup time if the TP logic is quite long? Yes, exactly. Um, so, what we'll see in a moment is that sometimes our clock skew can be helpful to us, and in fact we will use clock skew in some designs to help meet very, very harsh timing constraints. But yeah, before that, let's look at how we just try and minimise it overall. So, with a H tree, the delay to each one of these nodes is exactly the same due to the path length being exactly the same. 
except for the fact that obviously there will be process variations in these buffers and also the width of these wires will vary so it won't be exactly the same but it is as close as can be at the very least the length the physical distance that the clock signal has to travel to each of these nodes is going to be the same for every single node. Um, obviously we can't do this sort of um, configuration for every single piece of logic in our circuit, it would create a massive clock tree with a lot of power draw. So what we tend to do more lightly is we have a higher level H tree which distributes um, the clocks to tiles and then within each tile we use other routing techniques um, to make sure that we get a good delay. So in this circuit you can see that there's about 10 clock tiles that they've needed to distribute the clock to and then within each clock tile they'll use one technique to distribute the clock um, but between the clock tiles they'll use an H tree to make sure that the delay is roughly balanced. Right? So that's one option, we can use an H tree, we can make sure that the path length is exactly the same even if the exact delay along that path is different due to the um, buffers. Um, another thing we can do is um, a grid where we put our clock in on each of four sides and then we have a grid of connected wires and our clock will roughly propagate out like that and out like that and out like that and so the highest delay point will be the very centre point um, but you know that no point on this um, network of wires will be um, more than half a um, half a grid length in terms of skew away from uh, the source clock. So if you imagine the time taken to go from one end to the other, say that's 100 picoseconds, we know that this thing, this point here, the delay, um, the skew on this point is going to be 50 picoseconds, the delay here maybe is going to be 25 picoseconds and the delay here is going to be 25 picoseconds. Obviously the delay isn't balanced over the grid but the absolute value of the delay is minimised, right? Um, also this mean having a grid means that we can move these pieces of logic to wherever we want and we've always got access to a clock, right? It allows for lots of very easy last minute um, design changes right um, but obviously you wouldn't want to do this over your entire chip because this would cost even more power than the H tree and also um, having a um, network like this all the way over your chip there will be a lot of delay to get to the center so each of these grids needs to be quite small with the delay to each of these points here being relatively similar Right. Um, so let's have a look at what you might see in a real um, system. So this is a DEC Alpha 21164. So this was created somewhat uh, um, in the region of the 90s. Um, DEC unfortunately have gone out of um, business since there. Um, these two rows over here are the clock drivers. And then they produce... Um, allow the clock to be distributed to logic in these regions. Um, these extremely regular areas over here are going to be cache memory. Um, the region in the centre which is not very regular is going to be the uh, processing core. So that's going to be the um, data path and the control. And then over here uh, we see a fair bit of regular structure, so this looks like memory. Um, and there's probably going to be a memory controller 
over here as well. But we've got these clock drivers which are distributing the clock into the centre and out to the edges. Um, these are connected together from a global clock source. Um, and then the delay is um, uh, evened out within these clock drivers using something similar to an H tree, um, but it only in a single dimension. And so if we map the um, delay over the entire chip, we see our two clock driver regions over here at zero delay. And then the further we get from the clock drivers, the higher the de delay, but using the technique they've used here, so they've got a long line of drivers um, where the maximum distance to any point um, from a clock driver is relatively small. They managed to make sure that all the um, every single logic element is less than ninety picoseconds skew relative to every other logic element and also all the critical in um all the critical paths through their design are put closer to the clock drivers so they'll be in this sort of region so that um they all see the clock within 65 picoseconds of each other right so Quick recap of the sources of clock skew and jitter. So we've got our clock generation, this, whatever generates our clock will introduce some jitter. All right, uh, we've got our clock drivers, which will introduce skew due to differences in the, um, in the drivers. We've got our interconnect, which will introduce more skew because um, each bit of interconnect isn't going to be exactly the same. We've got our power supply, very fluctuations in our power supply. So maybe that is 3.3 volts. That's 3.4 volts and that's 3.2 volts. Variations in our power supply are going to cause changes in the delay of our uh, clock drivers and so that's going to introduce jitter to our system. So those are going to introduce jitter. And if there's a constant offset between the power supply between different clock drivers it's also going to introduce skew because that's basically overvolting one clock driver and undervolting the other relative to each other. We've got temperature, which introduces jitter. As our temperature changes, as you saw in lab three, um, the delay of our clock drivers and the delay of our wires is going to change. And so that will introduce jitter and possibly even skew if there is a region of the chip which is hotter than another region. We've got capacitive load, so as our the an, amount of stuff we attach to our clock um, to our clock endpoint increases, we're going to increase the capacitive load. It's going to be harder to charge up the clock signal, and so this is going to introduce skew. And we have capacitive coupling, where we've got other signals in our circuit, and when we try to charge up our clock signal that's going to in, um, induce energy to go on to other signals. If there's more um, signals um, close by then we're going to have more skew as we have to charge up surrounding wires to a small extent and we're going to lose energy to those surrounding wires but also if those surrounding wires are changing they're going to also induce voltages onto our clock signal and they're going to introduce jitter. Right? So we've got all these sources of skew and jitter in our circuit, right? Um, the skew generally based on differences in the design and also in the manufacturing, whereas the jitter more based on um, differences in what we supply to our circuit, right?
Um, and then obviously we need to minimize all of these and there's various different circuit design techniques. Um, if we just look at the capacitive coupling case, for example, if we try to shield our clock signal from the other signals in our circuit, keep it on a different layer of the um, different layer of metal and maybe put an interposer layer between them um, to shield off the electromagnetic interference that can reduce the skew and the jitter um, for the capacitive coupling and then the power supply if we make sure we've got lots of um, capacitance on our voltage rail we can reduce the variation in the power supply and if we make sure to have a good um, source across our entire um, circuit, we can make sure that the power supply is balanced between different clock drivers. We can make all these um, adjustments to reduce our jitter and skew. Or alternatively, we could just say, yes, we've got delay, we've got clock skew, let's just design around it, right? So originally we assumed that the delay was zero, that uh, the clock edges T clock 2 and T clock 1 were in the same place. But now we're going to say, right, we've got a delay, delta. How does that affect our, um, how does that um, affect our um, setup and hold times? Well, we need to make sure that data launched on clock edge 1 gets to this point here one setup time before clock edge four. So clock edge four is the second clock edge at this register and clock edge one is the first clock edge at this register. So we need to say, okay, the time from clock edge one to clock edge three is going to be T. And then from clock edge three to clock edge four is our delta. That is going to have to be greater than TCQ plus TP logic plus TSU, right? The data needs to get from here to here before one setup time. Conversely, when we look the other way around and we say the hold time, well, the hold time is um, our clock edge, um, well, is our clock edge two plus the hold, um, plus our hold time relative to, oh no, what am I doing? There. Right, so, give me one sec, my brain's gone wrong. Ugh. Right, um, uh, hold it. Hold. Yeah, right, okay. So, right, so the hold time constraint um, from clock edge one, the time for the data to get over to register two must be longer than the hold time after clock edge two, right? So, delta plus T hold, so that's the time at which the first clock edge reaches register two, must be less than T CD logic, so the time for the data to start coming out of R1, plus T CD reg, the time for data to start propagating through the combinational logic, okay? So we see that, okay, um, I'm just going to remove this while we go back to types text. So if we rearrange this slightly, we see that our um, clock period must be greater than or equal to our original um, constraint minus the clock skew. And our hold time must be less than or equal to our original constraint minus the clock skew. Oops. So if our um, clock skew is greater than zero, so we've got a positive skew, we can have a higher performance circuit because we can, re we can reduce 
our clock period and so we can increase our clock frequency. However, as our delta gets bigger, it makes it much harder to satisfy our hold time because this entire component here gets smaller. Once we get to the point where our delta is equal to TCD logic plus TCD reg, that would require a hold time of zero, right? So we can't have our um, delta too big, we can't have too much of a clock skew, otherwise we will start to violate our hold time. And remember, our hold time constraint is not dependent on our clock period or our clock frequency. So we need to make sure that our skew satisfies our hold time, then we can worry about our clock period because we cannot um, fix our hold time by changing our clock period. Uh, we've had a few questions, just a moment. Uh, why don't we consider any inductive coupling with regards to the supply and ground connections and length of wires as factors in skew and jitter? The information can be obtained from L-parasitic um, L parasitic extraction, right? Um, yeah, so if I just pop back a little bit, uh, where was it? Right, so here we just drew resistors on the interconnect. Really, this is resistor plus inductor plus capacitor, etc. So there is, yes, yeah, so there's, it's an inductance here, not just a resistance um, on the interconnect. So there is an inductance on the interconnect. Um, Obviously, there are various interactions between the power supply and the signals. The signals will induce um, variations in the power supply. Those various variations in the power supply will then cause variations in the delay on the clock drivers, which will then introduce um, jitter. So there's a lot of um, cross-connection between all these effects. So one of these effects might cause another effect to become worse or better. So if you've got a clock signal um, and then right next to it you've got your VDD as that clock varies it's going to induce a signal onto VDD and so our VDD will jump around. And if this VDD is now um, is providing voltage to a buffer, then that's going to change the propagation delay of this buffer. So they're all interlinked, um, and modeling this is actually quite a difficult thing to do. All you can really do is do a transient simulation and see, well, how much does it affect the power supply and things like that. What you can do though, yes, exactly, you can look at the inductance and other things like that and that will give you an idea of, for example, the delay from one end to the other of the interconnect, right? Um, another question, why delta is affecting T hold, isn't that the hold time in terms of the input of the flip-flop? Right, okay, let's just pop over here. Right, so our hold time constraints, if we look at R2, we need to say we've got our T clock 2 coming in. Right, and we've got our, so let's call this I2. There's our I2. We need to make sure that I2 happens one T hold before T clock 2. Okay, T clock 2 is defined relative to T clock 1, continue this down, with this delta here, right? And then I2 is defined relative to T clock 1 as this delay here, right? So re all relative to T clock 1, I2 will have a delay. T clock 2 will have a delay, and then we've got this hold time constraint we need to satisfy. So what we need to make sure is that the time um, we arrive, the time that um, I2 changes, 
must be sorry I drew that the wrong way round um, I2 should be going over there sorry and that's your hold time sorry um, so there's that delay right and then we've got the delay here so we want to make sure that I2 happens after T clock 2, not before, sorry, that's setup time, after T clock 2, right? So the time at which T clock 2 happens um, is delta. It needs to be 1T hold after delta, and then that is I2, right? So that is T of I2. This is T, um, the time of T clock 2. And it needs to be, I2 needs to be 1T hold after T clock 2, right? So that's why our delta is affecting our um, possible hold time constraint. Because as our delta increases, it becomes harder and harder to make sure that the delay through the combinational delogic and through register 1 is longer than that skew plus the hold time. Okay? <laughs> Sorry, can you draw it again? I don't quite get it. Okay, um, I will just open up the whiteboard because um, we are a bit crushed for space here. Right, so you've got register one and we've got register two, right? We've got our combinational logic and we've got our clock coming in here We've got some delay. Um, delta. Then our clock coming in here, right? So we've got, and then this is clock there, right? So our clock comes in to register 1, so clock 1, so this is the clock coming in to register 1, right? And let's say that is t equals 0. Sometime later, we have clock 2, t equals delta, right? Because there's a delay here, the time at which the clock reaches register 2 will be different from the time at which it reaches register 1, right? On our register 2, we have some data, right, so before this time, we have some data become available for it, right? So there's our setup time, and we've got some data ready for um r2 at its clock edge right and then sometime after that data changes again right so there's clock two sometime before the data changes and that's our setup constraint sometime after the data changes and that's our hold constraint right we need to make sure that this transition on the data does not happen before the hold time expires, okay? Um, because otherwise we'll corrupt the data coming out of the circuit, right? So that was I2, there's in, right? We need to make sure that this data isn't corrupted by the data that went through here becoming available here before the hold time. And so we say, okay, what time does it take to get from the clock edge to here? T, C, T, C, D logic. So this is the time at which anything changes on R1. How long does it take to get through here? That's T, C, sorry, that should say C, D reg, sorry. C, D logic the time it takes to get through our combinational logic. Um, 
and then before um, that needs to get to this point, I2, after the hold time has expired on R2, right? That's the constraint we are trying to satisfy. As we increase this delay here, clock 2 moves this way. And so the point at which I2 transitions also needs to move this way so that it's still um, after the hold time expires. So as our delay gets bigger, it becomes harder and harder to satisfy that hold time constraint because our clock 2 is moving this way relative to clock 1. Okay? Eleven fifty four. Right. Uh, only got two slides left. I think. Uh, right. Okay. Yep. Just two slides left. Uh, go back into there. So I'll run slightly longer than normal this time. Um, so here we see an example of negative clock skew. Right. So same thing as before. Um, because our delta. Is less so we're we're defining our signals in the same way where we say t plus delta. Oops. We say our t plus delta must be greater than the delay for the signal to get from here through to here, right? And similarly, our t hold plus delta must be shorter than the delay for it to get to here. But because this time with our negative clock skew, our delta is less than zero, it makes our performance worse. But because our t clock two moves backwards relative to t clock one, should probably put it here to be specific, right? It becomes easier to satisfy the hold time constraint, right? Because our hold time, if our hold time expires here, and our data can't get out till sometime after clock edge one, then we know we could never uh, have expired before the data is even launched from R1. Right, also that one. Get rid of that. Right. Okay, so negative clock skew, contrary to positive clock skew. Positive clock skew makes, means we can get better of performance, but it's harder to meet um, our hold time constraints. Negative clock skew means worse performance, but our hold time constraints are easier to make, um, meet. And so if we're saying that we've got a bad hold time in our circuit, we can introduce some delay in, um, introduce some negative delay to our clock tree to make sure that it's easier to satisfy our hold time. Conversely, if we're seeing that our performance isn't good enough, but we've got plenty of hold time, then we can introduce some delay in the positive direction, meaning that it's we can get some better performance out of our circuit at the cost of making our um, hold time harder to satisfy. But if we've got enough slack in that direction, it's very easy to take up some of that slack and improve our performance. And so then we get onto, well, what happens if we've got multiple paths through the circuit? What it generally ends up being is that we um, evaluate each path individually. And then we say, right, well, for our clock period, we need to say that every single one of these needs to meet the same clock period because our clock period is a global variable. It's the same across all registers. So we can say, okay, for path one, our clock period must be that. For path two, our clock period must be that or greater. Clock period for path three, the clock period must be that or greater. For path four, the clock period must be that or great, um, greater. 
and then we can say that our minimum clock period, hence our maximum frequency, will be the maximum of each individual clock period that's allowed. Right? And then so each hold time constraint we have to satisfy individually. We have to make sure that the contamination delay through any one of these paths does not um, fall short of the hold time. Notice, though, if you've got a path which loops back on itself, so if you look at path 2 and path 4 here, because it's the same register, you don't have skew with the same register, right? Because the skew is between different registers. So if you've got a path that loops back on itself, there is no clock skew, and hence you can't use it to either satisfy hold time constraints or to improve your performance. You have to make sure that the logic along that path is optimal and doesn't violate a hold time constraint. And so it's generally these loop back paths which are the hardest to satisfy. Because if you've got a straightforward path, for example, path one or path three, you can just adjust your skew to compensate for the delay. Whereas with loopback paths like path two and path four, there is no skew you can introduce. And so you have to design your logic appropriately. And that ends the system level timing lecture. Um, what have we got next lecture? I want to check quickly. Next lecture is lecture 18, pipelining. So we'll be looking at how we can improve our clock periods without um, fiddling with the skew next lecture and how we take a very long series of um, sequence of logic and split it up so that we can have a um, and split it up so that we can have a very high clock frequency. In the slide showing the deck clock skew do we consider no delay across the clock driver path? Uh, in the one with the clock um, so what happens is there's actually a one-dimensional H tree on that um, clock driver um, path here. Um, so what would be happening is from our input, our signal will go like that, like that, like that. It would look a bit like a binary tree. Um, to, pr to provide a signal to the entire clock driver structure at exactly the same time. So remember, skew is all relative from one register to another. That What is the difference in skew? Uh, the skew within the clock driver structure is zero because there's an H tree, um, H tree providing the signal to that clock driver structure and then from the clock driver structure the delay increases as you get further from the structure. And also out this way and out that way. Right, Scott can you please explain the hold time waveform for positive skew again? Okay. Um, I will do that um, in a sec. Are there any other questions before I go into a bit more detail on the hold time? Cool. So the positive clock skew is in favour of setup time and a negative skew is in favour of hold time. Exactly. Exactly. So if you've got a positive skew, it makes it easier to satisfy your setup constraint because T clock 2 is further away from T clock 1, or sorry, f because T clock 4 is further away from T clock 1, whereas if you've got a ne negative clock skew it makes it easier to satisfy the hold time constraint because T clock 2 is further, um, is closer or further back from T clock 1, right? Um, so yeah, you've got, you've hit the nail on the head there, Zeran. Right, another questions. Right, okay. Um, 
Oh, what is the trend for digital timing design right now? I guess it should be a combination of both tree and grid structure. Yes, exactly. Um, there's not really any significant trends in that aspect. Um, in that, like, the H tree idea has been around for donkey's years and it's always been used because it's an effective way to do things. The only real trend is the increased use of um, skew in order to help designers to meet timing constraints. Okay, um, as opposed to any, um, as opposed to trying get trying to get the logic um, to fit within a small period of time, because our clock, uh, because the different stages of our um, logic take different amounts of times, designers will specifically introduce delay to make sure that they're meeting timing in different areas. So we're starting to see more and more of the uh, manually introduced delay. And also more and more of the techniques where we've got different clock periods for different sections of logic. So sl we have slower bits of logic which have longer propagation delays and so we give them a slower clock Conversely, we have shorter pieces of logic which have a shorter propagation delay, so we give them a faster clock, right? And so rather than having just one set T, we have a few different T's, and then we just use whichever clock period is appropriate for that area of the chip in terms of how fast it runs. Okay? Right, okay. Um, so I think for... An from now I'm going to be focusing purely on if you want to go now um, do feel free to uh, oh, what's this question from Ziran is it possible to have a mux to choose between the different delays for clock signal to accommodate different kind of constraints for different design for example in an FPGA different design might be implemented or is this just solved by pipelining um, so in a fixed circuit you will generally fix your um, clock delays by pipelining. Um, in an FPGA, what you generally tend to have is you tend to have a programmable um, T clock. So what you do is you design your logic, right? You work out what the delay of the logic is, and then you say, right, my delay is 15 nanoseconds, therefore, I can have a 70 megahertz clock on my FPGA. So you actually adjust your T um, according to what your design is, um, and with an FPGA, the uh, clock generation primitives are programmable. They allow you to generate any clock frequency you want, right? Um, but theoretically, you can use multiplexers to differentiate between different pieces of logic, um, possibly even use different clock frequencies, but it's much easier to just have a programmable clock pr primitive, honestly. So yeah, we because we don't want to have too much logic on the clock distribution path because it then introduces a lot of skew. So yes, it's possible. No, we tend not to do that in reality because there's better, more effective techniques than using a MUX to choose between different clock delays. Okay, um, especially since once we put our logic on the, um, on the board, it's fixed anyway, so it's not going to change at runtime. Um, unless we undervolt our chip, at which point we change our um, we change our clock frequency. Right. Okay. So hold time constraints. Is there a better way to describe this? Um, right. So register one. I'm just going to put these a bit further apart this time. So this is just looking at hold time. Register one and register two. Right. Output one, input two, and then we've got some combinational logic between the two. Combinational logic, right? So here's the clock entering R1, clock one, and then sometime later, here's the clock entering register two. Clock two, clock one, clock two, right? 
some data becomes available on input one, right? So input one has some data. Let's say this data is 12, right? And then sometime after that's going to change again, right? On this clock edge, I should say input one, input one, there we go. So on this clock edge, the data on input one is going to be copied over to output one. So what we're going to see is that output one, sometime after the clock edge, is going to change. Just to make that a bit shorter. Right, and so we get output one becomes available, right? So if output one becomes available at this point in time, sometime later, output one is going to cause input two to become available. Okay, so input one changed, then the clock edge happened and it got copied to output one. Because output one changed, Sometime later, it got copied to input, well, not copied exactly, it got modified and became input 2, right? And so data arrives at input 2, right? Now, this register here has something called a hold time constraint. We've got our clock edge, and then we have our data is available, and then it changes. Right? What we expect maybe is for this data to become 13, say. So, uh, I2. Maybe we expect for output to. to become 13, because input 1 was 12 and it was adding 1 or something, right? So we expect output 2 to become 13. But that will only happen if I2 happens after the whole time, right? If instead we have our clock 2 and then we have our I2 change like this. Uh, sorry. I2. And our hold time is actually to here. What we're going to see is that our output 2 won't become 13. Instead of becoming 13, it became, or oh, what would be a good example? Uh, let's say it became five, because for some reason, our signal didn't get all the way through the logic inside the register because we didn't satisfy the hold time constraint. Our I2 changed before our hold time constraint, but after our clock edge. And so O2 got corrupted. It wasn't 13, which is what it was supposed to be. It ended up as five. Right? As... Right. Um, so we need to make sure that I2 happens after the hold time. Like that. However, as the delay from clock 1 to clock 2, so that's this thing here, delta, as this increases, clock 2 is moving be to here. Right? As this delta increases, clock 2 is going to move in that direction. Right? And so instead of seeing clock 2 where we saw it before, maybe clock 2 is now here. Right? It's being moved later because delta is bigger now. Right? And this time, 
our hold time constraint is here, and we fill the hold time constraint, right? As we increase this delta, because clock 2 moves that way, compared to clock 1, I2 moves that way compared to clock 2. And so satisfying that hold time constraint where we must be after the hold time has expired in order for our data to stay valid becomes harder. Does that answer your question, Varun? Yes, Scott. Uh, I think it answers. But uh, can you explain with respect to this uh, diagram on the right hand side where you showed that, uh, yeah, that uh, whole time it actually kind of uh, is violated in this case? Sorry, say again? Uh, th this right hand diagram uh, where the uh, uh, whole time is actually violated. Uh, so, mm -hmm. whole time is actually uh, being considered uh, after how many, uh, like, after what portion of the second clock uh, till the... Right, yeah. So, from the 50% point of clock 2, right, for some time okay. afterwards, I1 must not... So, sorry, I2 must not go past its 50% point, right? So, it's all done 50% point to 50% point. Um, okay. But, so there is going to be some delay from clock 2 until I2 occurs, right? So say that delay is 100 picoseconds. That 100 picoseconds must be greater than or equal to T hold. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Right. Brilliant. Uh... For some circuits which might have different clock frequencies for different parts, or for circuits which can change their clock frequencies due to power constraints like in modern processors, is there a way to dynamically manage the skew and jitter, or is it design just designed keeping minimum constraints from maximum frequency in mind? Um, so basically what you're asking then, Jaideep, is how do we get a signal between two different clock domains, effectively. So you've got one clock that's at 100 megahertz and one clock that's at 80 megahertz. How do we get between the two? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a timing diagram for this because it's the easiest way to deal with it. One, two, three. I think it happens after four on the 100 megahertz clock, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to draw a little bit longer. Right, so say we've got a 100 megahertz clock, right? Oh, so, yeah, sorry, so, yeah, because that's going to be there, so I'm going to need one more maybe, right? And we've got an 80 megahertz clock, right? So let's say they both happen initially at t equals zero. Right? Well, 100 megahertz clock, the next time, T equals 10 nano, T equals 20 nano, T equals 30 nano, T equals 40 nano, T equals 50 nanoseconds. Right? So these are the times at which we see the rising edges on our 100 megahertz clock, right? And then obviously that one's going to be T equals 60 nano, right? On our 80 megahertz clock, it's going to be a bit longer. Uh, right, I need to make sure I get this right. So there, there, yep. Ah, uh, no, sorry, no, I got that wrong. Right, so, because, uh, each one of those is five, so I need to go halfway. Right, okay. There. 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 And there. Right, okay. And then I can just draw those. Right, so so with our 80 megahertz clock, we're going to have T equals 12.5 nano. T equals 
uh, 25 nano, T equals 37.5 nano, and T equals 50 nan nano. So we take our two clocks, we say what's their, uh, take, go back to their periods, and we say what's the uh, lowest common multiple for these two, right? In this case, it's going to be 50 nano, which is going to be five clock cycles of the 100 megahertz clock, or four clock cycles of the 80 megahertz clock, right? And then what we say is, say we're going from 80 megahertz logic to 100 megahertz logic. We say for each of the rising edges on the 80 megahertz logic, we need to make sure that the setup and hold times are um, are satisfied to the next um, to the current clock edge and the next clock edge. Right. So obviously, for the t equals zero case, it's very easy to um, satisfy this one because there's no clock skew; they're exactly the same. If we take the t equals 12.5 case here, we're going to see that it's going to be easy to satisfy, very, very easy to satisfy the whole time constraint because where some are clock two is going to be, or no, sorry, no, other way around. Sorry, it's going to be, so as this gets delayed, we're going to see that it's going to be either harder to satisfy the hold time constraint here, or harder to con satisfy the setup constraint here, right? And we look at each of these 80 megahertz clock edges to the corresponding um, clock edge on our 100 megahertz signal, and we say, what's our setup and hold constraint? And we have to solve all of these until our clocks resynchronize. So we start off with them synchronized at t equals zero. They resynchronize at t equals 50 nanoseconds. And so for every clock edge in that region, we need to make sure that the setup and hold time constraints are satisfied. The easiest way to do this. Oops. Let's do that a bit nicer is to have two registers connected directly co together with the 80 megahertz and the 100 megahertz, right? And then maybe introduce a little bit of delay here um, in order to satisfy the hold time at this clock edge here. Right, that's the easiest way to deal with this. You just put a series of flip flops it, um, together in a row, and then normally that will satisfy the hold time constraints. Um, this structure is called a synchronizer when you've just got a number of flip flops in a row with different clock frequencies. That's called a synchronizer, right? Um, if they all had the same clock frequency, it would be called a shift register. But yeah, that's the way we generally tend to um, get data between different um, pieces of logic. We simply, um, we just have to analyze all the hold time constraints until the two clocks become um, synchronized back up from a point where they were synchronized. Does that answer your question, Jaideep? Yep, brilliant. Okay, yeah. Um, by the way, everything I've been t teaching you here, if you ever use a FPGA synthesis tool, it's doing all those calculations in the background to work out whether your design um, meets timing or not. So every time when you see, oh, design failed timing, um, that means that one of these setup or hold time constraints that I've been showing you has failed, right? And it's doing all these calculations on every single start point and end point very, very quickly within the software. Um, from the code point of view, is there a, diff 
want ways to cross clock domains. Um, honestly, just implement a couple of registers in sequence and then that will get you between the different clock domains. Um, also, there is um, the other thing you can do is a FIFO. Um, most tools, uh, most FPGA synthesis tools will have a FIFO dual clock. Right, um, where you've got a first in fir first out structure with a different clock on the input and the output. Using that structure, you can have um, you can put data in on one clock domain and then cycle it out on a different clock domain. Um, so in code, you'll either you you'll either manually write a synchronizer just by implementing a load of individual flip flops, or you'll use a FIFO dual clock if you want a slightly more complex structure. Okay. Right. Okay. I will end it for um here for today then. Um. Thank you for listening. And next lecture is on pipelining, which will be fun. Um. Uh, because it's more of this, but it's a slightly more abstract level. All right. Um. See you.